Good morning. This is Dr. Nick Tulo with the ECG Academy. And I'm very happy that you joined me this Saturday morning. It's uh, sunny in New Jersey. Luckily, we haven't really felt the brunt of the storms that uh, are hitting the uh, southeast here in the United States. So I have a great case to present and I hope you enjoy it. Remember, if you enjoy this content, please uh, check in the description. You can uh, just sign on to my uh, ECG doc account at, on YouTube and uh, please share it with your friends. So let's get to the discussion. Hello. So it, I, uh, my, one of my partners had this patient that uh, she um, showed me the Holter monitor and I met with her uh, as a consultation. Now she's 72 years old and has a history of atrial fibrillation dating back to around 2010. At that time, another cardiologist was taking care of her and uh, her echocardiogram looked pretty normal. So they decided to put her on a combination of metoprolol and flecainide. The flecainide is a 1C agent and it's usually very effective to treat atrial fibrillation, but she kept having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She would feel palpitations and uh, didn't like the feeling. So uh, she was referred for an AFib ablation. So catheter, atrial, catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation is generally done uh, using a technique known as pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, so you uh, basically create a linear lesions around the pulmonary veins since that's where atrial fibrillation usually comes from. So around 2011, she had this AFib ablation. Unfortunately, it didn't work. That's, un that's a, a common problem is that atrial fibrillation ablation, you know, even under ideal circumstances may only have a, a 70 or 80% success rate. Well, she didn't want to go through another ablation. She also started having atrial flutter. So they put her back on flecainide and metoprolol. And then in the meantime, she had some other medical problems. She had uh, 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 issues with cancer and she had to have surgery and so for a couple of years she was involved with chemotherapy and so forth but continued to have palpitations uh, intermittent but uh, she learned to live with it she figured okay this is just me uh, but her cardiologist um, kept her on the combination of flecainide and metoprolol um, except that she came to us for another opinion because over the last month she started having episodes of lightheadedness. And this was new for her. The lightheadedness was, well, pretty severe. She would have to hold on. And it would, it would like sometimes her vision would actually get a little bit dark, but generally within three or four seconds, the sensation would pass and she never actually fainted. She never fell down. So my partner decided to do a 24 hour Holter monitor. So I'm going to show you the heart, the heart rate uh, trend here over the 24 hours and uh, this is directly from the Holter monitor. So uh, as you can see here, if I can uh, try to draw on it, that um, she, uh, here's the heart rate on the left hand side. So you have, um, make that a little bit bigger, uh, between 50 and 100. So during the day, uh, she's running heart rates averaging around 100 beats per minute. And um, actually in her diary, she did a little bit of exercise. So right here, her heart rate hit 120 beats a minute. And then in the evening, she was pretty active and got up to between 100, 120. But during the night, she went to sleep and pretty much had an, a heart rate of around 75 uh, during sleep until she woke up the next morning. So uh, most people would look at this heart rate trend and say, well, that's not too bad. So let's look at the tracings. So here's the first tracing that, uh, this is kind of an average rhythm strip during the day. And you can see now that it's irregularly irregular. Uh, you have uh, longer intervals and shorter, and you have sort of a disorganized baseline here. So uh, even if you look at the wider strip, it looks like atrial fibrillation. I mean, sometimes it kind of has that sort of fluttery appearance, but unless it's, uh, I don't like to call it flutter unless it's really consistent, stable rhythm pattern. Um, and, and here it clearly isn't because sometimes you have 
much faster, more disorganized signals. So pretty much some people would call it a flutter fib, but I don't kind of I don't like that terminology. I'd rather just call it fibrillation. And the rate here averaging about 90 beats per minute is what she was doing at rest. And then when she would um, do something a little bit more active here, her heart rate goes up to 120. And you have, again, it's still irregularly irregular, so she is in atrial fibrillation. So the first question is, how do you like her medications? Because after all, she is on flecainide in order to try to maintain sinus rhythm. I mean, that's what flecainide is for. 1C agents like flecainide and propafenone are designed to maintain sinus rhythm most of the time, at least. And so uh, it doesn't look like it's working, first of all. And the metoprolol is doing a decent job to control the ventricular response. And so far, there's nothing here that would explain her lightheadedness. Uh, now, I did see something interesting, and I'm going to go back to the tracing here, um, that when her heart rate gets a little bit faster, here it's 130 beats per minute, you can see that the QRS complex starts to widen out. It's still irregularly irregular. It never gets terribly fast. Here the rate gets to be about 150 beats per minute, but it's wide now. Can anybody uh, explain why this the QRS complex gets wide at these faster rates? Oh, by the way, I'm just looking to see. I, I thank you, uh, Ricardo. Thank you very much. I'm so happy you're a big fan of mine. Um, uh, uh, that was. It's, it's a, not a very good Italian accent, uh, but I, well, I am Italian, Tullo, hey, what do you think? From the Bronx, so I talk like this really you know, most of the time. So, and Jan, hello, thank you. So if anybody has an idea of why the QRS gets wide, please comment. But <clears throat> there's something about flecainide that most people don't really think about. And you pharmacologists out there, you guys that are really into the antiarrhythmic effects and everything, flecainide has something called use dependence. And this is kind of an advanced topic, but use dependence uh, depend, it tells, it, what it means is that the faster the heart rate, the more of, a, of an electrophysiologic effect flecainide will have. So flecainide, as you know, being a class one agent, primarily blocks sodium channels and blocks them very profoundly. So uh, it slows conduction down in the uh, atrial myocardium. And um, in, pharmacologically speaking, it affects phase zero, which is the rapid sodium inflow into the cells without getting too bogged down into the electrophysiology of it. But the faster the heart rate, the more effect flecainide has on those sodium channels. And I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going to take a little sip from my uh, Pura Vida from Costa Rica. Mm. Ah, Alex Ante says uh, it's good coffee. So use dependence means at faster rates, flecainide is going to have more of an effect. And we commonly see this widening of the QRS because all of a sudden, a lot of the sodium channels are getting blocked. And when you block the rapid phase zero upstroke, it slows conduction through the Purkinje system and through the myocardium. So this is probably just a rate-related aberrancy that we can see with flecainide when patient goes into high rates with this atrial fibrillation. But even here at a rate of 150, she didn't have any symptoms. Uh, so what do you think is going on? Well, um, as Steve Jobs used to say at uh, Macworld convention, there's just one more thing. So the, the last picture I have from the Holter monitor um, is right here. Let me put my display up here. Aha, aha. Now, this is uh, in the middle of the night, and uh, so she actually didn't feel it. But uh, what you can plainly see is that she has what looks kind of like an atrial fib or flutter or whatever you want to call it. And then suddenly there is nothing. Um, ever, anybody ever see the movie Flatliners? Well, that's what's happening here is that you have no rhythm and um, suddenly you do have what looks like a sinus beat and then the patient is in sinus rhythm. So first thing people will wonder is, oh, maybe the wire fell off. Well, no, you have a clear change in rhythm. 
you went from atrial flutter fibrillation to sinus rhythm. And with that, you had this enormous pause, a sinus pause. The sinus node didn't wake up. So what you have is a very, very exaggerated effect of overdrive suppression that the sinus node is characteristic for. But with this, if, if she was awake, she would have passed out. Now, does anybody, um, there, there was actually a study that was done and it, it takes on average about six seconds of a lack of blood flow to the brain before someone loses consciousness. It could be four, it could be eight in some patients, but the median was six seconds. And so if somebody has a six second pause, uh, not only could they get lightheaded, but they can just go down like a sack of potatoes and um, pass out with no warning whatsoever. So we felt this was a serious finding and would appear to be a reasonable explanation for her lightheaded spells. So what would you do with the patient? Well, the first thing we did was we called her up. I told her, don't take any more flaconide because first of all, it's not working. And second, although it doesn't usually affect sinus node function, in people with sick sinus syndrome, it can suppress sinus node function. Um, but she's still on metoprolol in a fairly high dose. It was, was 50 in the morning and 75 in the evening. And that was just for rate control. So what do we do with this patient? Well, how many people would recommend a pacemaker? What we've established here is, is, is tachycardia, bradycardia syndrome. So the atrial fibrillation wasn't the cause of her symptoms, but it, she obviously spontaneously breaks out of atrial fibrillation and is now prone to having these really, really long pauses, which can cause presyncope and even syncope. So I basically told her that she is at risk of falling over, breaking a hip, breaking her head. It's a serious problem, but what to do? So the easiest thing is just to recommend a pacemaker. The pacemaker will obviously correct the bradycardia, but what about the atrial fibrillation? I mean, she still does get palpitations every now and then. Uh, so, but at this point, she really has a lot of different options. You know, one of the things that people have considered is that, well, if you can get rid of the atrial fibrillation, then maybe she won't have any pauses anymore, right? If you get rid of the overdrive suppression, uh, then you don't have to worry about the pauses. And then, so one of her options would be to just go back and have another AFib ablation. The problem is that at age 72, um, the, the risk is a little bit higher. The success rate still isn't going to be more than 70 or 80%. And so she still is going to be prone to having these kinds of pauses and, um, I didn't think that that was an ideal solution. I thought it, what we're trying to do here is protect the woman against injury, right? I mean, a pause like this isn't gonna kill anybody unless they're at the top of a flight of stairs when it happens. So you have to look at the patient overall and try to help them figure out what's best. Now, flaconide was the only medication she'd ever been on for atrial fibrillation. And so conceivably, we could control her arrhythmia with another medication. But unfortunately, the class three agents all have effects on sinus node as well. Uh, amiodarone, sodalol, maybe dofetilide, which is ticosin, might not have as much of an effect. But there she'd have to be admitted to the hospital for three days. And for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, ticosin is really not that effective either. So what I recommended is that she have a permanent pacemaker and that would protect her against the Brady portion of this syndrome. And then we would be free to try other medications such as Sotolol or um, uh, perhaps even Multac, uh, which is Dronetarone. And we may hit upon something that would control her symptoms. Um, meanwhile, she does need to be on anticoagulation because uh, uh, she has the stroke risk that we have to deal with. She has hypertension, age 72, so she has a few Chaz Vask uh, factors. Uh, but what I uh, suggested is that once the pacemaker's in, then she'll have the option to either try a medication or two 
Or then maybe if that doesn't work, either live with the atrial fibrillation and just remain anticoagulated, or if the symptoms are still a problem, then we could consider possibly trying the AFib ablation again uh, with the understanding that it may not work. So this is, um, uh, I, I, one, of the, one of the things that I talk about is, you know, when you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, sometimes it's not the AFib that causes the symptoms, it's these post-tachycardia pauses. And I want you to just recognize what a post-tachycardia pause is. And again, it's related to overdrive suppression of the sinus node uh, from the rapid atrial arrhythmia. And then the sinus node just takes forever to wake up again before uh, the sinus rhythm kicks back in. So I just thought this was really cool. And, um, you know, it's food for thought, like how to treat patients like this. Uh, sure, it's easy to say, oh, just put a pacemaker in, but then what do you do? Uh, in terms of treating the atrial fib, in terms of the, whether to recommend catheter ablation, um, it's, it, it, every patient is an individual and you really have to make those decisions um, based on the patient's history, their needs, their symptoms, and so forth. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion. It's uh, go enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And uh, if you really like this, please again, support me by uh, uh, subscribing to my YouTube account, ECG Doc. And if you really like this and you want to learn more about arrhythmias and complex rhythm diagnoses and how to read a 12 lead ECG, you can also uh, find a link to my website, ecgacademy.com. If you go in the uh, description, you'll find a link to reach that. And uh, until next week, this is Dr. Nick Tulo. Thanks for watching.